So this is a continuation of the capital budgeting chapter. Today we're going to do uh, basically the internal rate of return, NPV profiles, and a couple of items related to that, the modified internal rate of return. So the last, uh, last lecture stopped at the pros and cons of NPV. NPV is still the golden standard in capital budgeting methods because it considers time value of money, considers all cash flows, shows increase in shareholder wealth. So right now you know what the present value, net present value of your investment is going to be in today's dollars. The problem is the discount rate is not readily available. So just, just to go, go back just a little bit here, this discount rate here, 10%, is the cost of capital, and we did a whole chapter on that. So to avoid that, the internal rate of return was devised. So here's your cost, CF0, which in your, in your calculators, if you hit the CF button, you see CF0, and uh, that's your initial investment. And then C01, C02, and this F is frequency, is uh, uh, they are your, uh, ca your cash inflows, the return from the investment, basically. So the internal rate of return is the discount rate that forces present value of inflows to the cost. So literally, this is the formula. This is the idea of internal rate of returns. So at what rate of return, or at what discount rate, rather, the present value of these cash flows, CF1 through CFN, is going to be exactly equal to CF0. At that point, is basically the break-even. So if you think of it, I mean, this is also an extension of the formula. This is the same as forcing net present value equal to zero, because what is net present value? Is the, is the present value of the sum of the future cash flows minus your CF0, which is your initial cost. So that's your, that, at that point, NPV equals zero. That's a very important graphical interpretation as well, which uh, I'll show to you. So NPV, if you remember, you know, your cash flows, your sum of cash flows, the counter starts at T equals zero. That means CFT uh, equals zero. That's your initial cash uh, uh, outflow. And you sum them, and that's with the negative sign. So that's why it all adds up to NPV. And uh, that's your NPV, but you need to know R. With internal rate of return, we don't know the R, but we say NPV equals zero at the point of break even, basically. And this R becomes your variable that you have to calculate. And that's a messy calculation because think of it, you have an X, X is in your denominator and uh, it has an exponent there, so it becomes a polynomial. And if your polynomial is a de denominator, it becomes a little problematic. So there's an iteration way to solve it and it's built into your calculator. <clears throat> so what is franchise as internal rate of return? So here are your, uh, your, your cash inflows, 10, 60, and 80. Remember, we're still working with two cash uh, lines, L and S, two projects. IRR was given as 10 previously, but it's not. We, this is a variable that uh, we want to identify here, uh, uh, estimate. Your initial cash outflow is $100. That means you spent 100 bucks. Present value one, present value two, present value three, if you add them up, your NPV, that's your NPV, this should be equal to zero. So in your calculator, if you enter these, but you don't have the discount rate, so let's, let's actually do that, CF0 minus 100. This is actually uh, very simple in a way. But it's actually the hardest of the calculations, but because of the calculator has been simplified to be the simplest of the calculations. CF0 minus 100. C01 is 10. Enter. F is the frequency. That means the number of times that particular cash flow happens. So default is 1. In your homework problems, uh, other places, you may change that to save yourself time. To like 2, 3, 4, how many times it happens. C02 is 60. Hit enter. NF is 80, you know. And then do not hit anything here, otherwise they'll think that the fourth cash flow is zero. And then there you see it cycles back. That's CF0 minus 100. Okay, so that's good. You can clear the screen here. Actually, just check. Minus 100, 10, 60, and 80. Always cross check. Just clear the screen. If you remember NPV, it asks you for the interest rate, which is the discount rate. 
and then it computes the NPV. Just, 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 just for the fun of it, you know, let's just do 10%, the interest rate, and then NPV compute, that's 1878 if that number looks familiar. But remember this time we're not doing NPV actually, we're doing IRR. So let's clear this here, Hit IRR. <laughs> See how simple it is? You don't even have to enter an input there. Just hit the compute button and there's your 18.13. Now the two, in this particular case, they look deceptively close. Big difference is this is a percentage. So IRR is because rate of return is a percentage. It's not a dollar amount. NPV is a dollar amount. So the three capital budgeting techniques, the payback method is time, how much time it takes to pay your initial investment, get your investment back. NPV is a dollar amount and IRR is your percentage amount. So here it is, 18.13. Uh, nice homework to do would be to cross-check all of this work and make sure that you get IRRS as 23.56. Just that. This is not, nothing big. This actually it looks uh, involved. This is actually the easy stuff. If the internal, what, what is the internal rate of return if the cash flows are constant? So then this defaults to your time value of money keys here, which if, if suppose you are doing this with an older calculator which did not have these buttons, then you would enter payment as 40 because then your cash flows are the same. But with the cash flow re register calculator that we have, we can actually use, uh, um, we can have unequal cash flows. So this is, just that, it's just you enter payment there and your IRR is going to be IY, hit IY and you get that. So that's the easy stuff there. What is the rationale for the IRR method? Basically, if the internal rate of return, that discount rate at which the present value of your future cash flows is exactly equal to your initial investment, if that is greater than your cost of capital or weighted average cost of capital, then the project's rate of return is greater than its cost. So some return is left over to boost the stockholder returns. And uh, so in this case, if it's 10% IRR, 15% is profitable and you undertake the project. As you know, it's, it's never simple. The good thing about IRR, it considers time value of money. Yeah, because you know, we, we use a discounting factor. It considers all cash flows relatively easy to understand. Actually, this is one of the main reasons why it is used, it is preferred by corporate managers as opposed to NPV even today, because they like to see a percentage number. Also, suppose you know, you're investing $300 million in a project and the NPV of that project is uh, $150,000. Now that's a good chunk of money, right? But the, the company may not accept that project because it's not worth the $250,000, uh, $250 million. Uh, so that's where rate of return comes in handy. And that's why they prefer the internal rate of return, even though very soon I'm gonna now show you the shortcomings of that. And the, but the biggest reason why IRR is good is because you don't need to know a discount rate to calculate. It actually gives you the discount rate at which you break even. Of course, there are problems one of the problems is for non-conventional cash flow patterns, you'll have multiple IRRs. So non-conventional cash flow pattern, I, I, I showed it to you, but I, I can show it to you again, is basically where there's a change in sign. Like if you're doing a nuclear plant, or uh, you know, if you're having a strip mining project, where after a few years, you have to make a significant capital outlay again to, to clean up the heavy water, to, uh, to, uh, to, uh, to backfill the strip mine, plant trees on it. So in that case, you have initial investment with a negative sign, and then you have uh, some cash inflows coming to you, and then again you have an additional outlay which, uh, with a negative sign. So in that case, you'll have multiple IRRs, so that's a problem. When that happens, use NPV. Decision on project S and L, for IRR, S and L are independent. If they're independent, you accept both because your cost of capital is 10%. And, and here you got, you got what? Uh, 18 and 23%, which is greater than 10%, so you're good. However, if they're mutually exclusive, that means you can only have one. So if you remember the example, maybe you can have uh, Walmart 
can have Walmart bank or can have either a um, warehouse in Augusta or in Brewer, just that, not both. So then it just takes one of them. If that is the case, then you take IRRS because the internal rate of return is 23%, which is higher than 18%. Even though 18% itself qualifies itself to be a good project, but if they're mutually exclusive, you take the one with the higher IRR. This is very important material there in your homework and you're gonna see it later on as well. It's something called an NPV profile. This is something literally as a corporate manager, especially if you're in finance, you may be able to do. And even if you're not in finance, let's say you are in management or in marketing or accounting at a company like Home Depot, Walmart, IBM, or General Dynamics for that matter, uh, as a manager, it would be good if you can understand if, uh, if the finance team is showing you an NPV profile. So what is an NPV profile? Is the NPV of the project at different uh, opportunity cost of capital. Basically, that's what it is. So in a way, it's three-dimensional. So we just did this calculation. At 10%, we got 18.78 and 19.98, if you refer to your notes. But what if the opportunity cost is 15%? What if there's inflation in the economy or 20%? What if the discount rate is even or lower, like it is now, so the NPV is higher. See, right here I can go off on a major tangent in a way and link, you know, what is happening and happened in our economy. So the, the Fed, by aggressive quantitative easing, has been able to lower the interest rates that are available to business uh, owners. And once again, finance is usually non-intuitive. You see that as the discount rate goes down, the NPV, which is a net profit to an entrepreneur, goes up actually. And as the discount rate goes higher, you know, because the cost of borrow is high, as simple as that, uh, your NPV, a profitable project, becomes actually a non-profitable project. So basically you just do the calculation. When you have this NPV here, hit the NPV button, I equals 10, let's say I, I um, a 5, enter, NPV, and that's 33.05 right here. What about 20%? If the interest rate is 20%, your discount rate is 20%. Oh, compute here. Minus 3.7. This is aggressively rounded here to minus 4. Should make it minus 3.7. It's too aggressive a rounding up. Back in the day, and this is my day, back in 91, 92, 91 I started my doctoral program. FYI, I did not know the difference between a bond and a stock because my master's was in quantitative economics. I did not know the difference between a bond and a stock. And uh, at that time we didn't have, we had, the calculator you have is BA2 plus. We just had the BA2, which did not have the NPV and uh, IRR buttons. So this is how we used to calculate uh, the internal rate of return. The internal rate of return is given by the points at which this line, the NPV profile here, touches the x-axis. And uh, the point of intersection of these two is also very important, and that's called the crossover point. So we have dollars. I mean, just think of dollars on the y-axis and percentage on the x-axis. Because, and you may want to update your slide. Not update, but you can make a note. This discount rate, of course, is correct. Uh, you can also write IRR there. It's basically any, anything that's a percentage on your x-axis, a dollar amount is on your y-axis. So just like what I did here, for different R's, you will get different NPVs. So then that's a point there, right there you can, so let's say the blue one, right here, blue one here, you plot it at, at 50, NPV at 50 is at R equals zero. Now that makes intuitive sense, wouldn't that, guys? Your cost of borrow is nothing. So naturally, your profit is going to be the highest. NPV is the highest. As your cost of borrowing increases, your NPV decreases. Now that's for the blue project, let's call it. For the green project, you have a separate line. At cost of capital zero, the NPV is 40. So it goes here. The point where NPV is equal to zero, that means this, this dollar amount here is zero, that is your IRR. That's, remember I said that's a definition, literally? So you can read off this, the point where this 
blue line touches the x-axis, that's 18%, and here is 23.6% approximately, and at that time the approximate answers were okay, in a sense, like few decimals. Uh, so you get your internal rate of returns. But there's another point which also I want to draw your attention to. The, that's called the crossover point. The significance of this crossover point for a corporate manager is reasonably interesting, if I may say, at the least, if not significant. It's interesting because at that point, at that discount rate in the market, actually, the desirability of a project switches. To all the points to the left of this, this project is superior, the user world is superior or dominates. To the right of this discount rate, this point here, the green project dominates. And that creates a problem of choice. It's always a problem of choice. Like I said, you know, whether a town should have a fire station, that's not really the big question. The question is, the choice that you really have is how big the fire station should be, you know. Now, whether we should have dinner, that's not a question. I mean, we should have dinner. Now, whether we should go out for the third helping of the apple pie, you know, that is the difficult question, and you can have discussion on that. So, same way here, you know. So, this, 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 the, the, so the, which project to take then? And that's when you, you need to have a good idea, and that's where information comes in of what the future interest rate is going to be. And that's what keeps people busy. And by now, you guys know enough about forecasting or the difficulty or the inability or, if I may say, the impossibility of forecasting economic outcomes, actually. For those of us, and most of us, we are trained, we are all logical people just because we are the human species, you know, so we like to reduce uncertainty by having forecasts. And you can forecast some of the physical variables a little bit more than some of the variables in social sciences. And if you recognize that, you'll be fine. The NPV and IRR, they always lead to the same accept or reject decision for independent projects. So at this point here, internal rate of return uh, is given by this point of intersection with the blue line. The internal rate of return, which uh, I think is 18 percent here, yes. yeah, 18, 18.1. That's greater than your discount rate, so that's you accept it. And the NPV is greater than zero. Why is the NPV greater than zero? To every point just to the delta left of this, you have a positive dollar amount here, so you accept it. To the right of this, however, there's a conflict. The discount rate here is higher than 18 percent. And the NPV is less than zero. Actually, there's no conflict here. It's actually easy here because it's a clear rejection. Your discount rate is higher than your uh, internal rate of return. So that's a reject by the IRR criteria. And the NPV criteria also fails because your NPV for any discount rate, so think of it, any, any market interest rate greater than 18%, you'll have a negative uh, dollar return on your investment. So that's an easy reject there. The problem is if it's a mutually exclusive project. With mutually exclusive project, we had the crossover rate as 8.7. Think about this, guys. This looks a little busy, but we are in a graduate class here. R less than 8.7, what do you see? NPVL is greater than NPVS, okay? NPVL is greater than NPVS to all points to the left of this. And IRRS is greater than IRRL. However, IRRS, which is given by 23%, is greater than 18%. So there's a conflict. To the right of 8.7, there is no conflict because NPV of this line, project S, dominates the NPV of L, and the internal rate of return also agrees. The internal rate of return of project S, which is 23%, is higher than 18%, no conflict. So what do you do when there's a conflict? So the decision rule is, whenever there's a conflict, you always defer to NPV. Really, you always defer to NPV. So in this case, you would pick up Project L, even though the internal rate of return of Project S is higher if there's a conflict. That's how you break the tie. To find the crossover rate is something that's uh, not well highlighted in the book. Um, but like I said, we used to use the graph for doing that. Yes, Mike? Why do you use NPV? Because in IRR, you can get multiple rate of returns. Oh, okay. 
Yeah, NPV does not have that problem. And internal rate of return also has a another very major shortcoming which we have not covered yet. It's 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 like a very uh, very it's it's like a devastating shortcoming. Is uh, a fast forward here is. The assumption built into the IRR calculation is that the additional cash flows in the future, they are reinvested at the internal rate of return. Translate that into modern language. Apple has a high internal rate of return over the last three, four, five years, you know, because it came up with a product that did not exist on the planet. Blackberry was a big thing before that, you know, they came up with something like a touch screen, some kind of a messaging system. But that means that they'll keep creating a product like that to generate and maintain that high internal rate of return. Whereas NPV has a very robust assumption built in that additional cash flows are reinvested at the market opportunity cost of capital. Right? So if Apple is making a profit, it doesn't have another idea for another type of iPhone except putting a gold plate on it, you know. They can always put it, you know, into literally they, they can buy Google stock with it. They could invest in a bank. So that's the reason. Good question. Always like your questions. So to find the crossover rate, you find the cash flow difference between the projects. So I'm showing you a very simple way how to find the crossover rate instead of doing this graphical way. But the graphical way, you know, you understand what is happening. Enter these differences in the cash flow register and press IRR and the crossover rate will pop out. As simple as that. So basically think of it, you have project S and project L, you have the cash flows here, where are the cash flows, we have to go real back actually. So here are cash flows 10, 60, 80 and I think the other one was like 70, 50 and 20. So you subtract one from the other, doesn't matter which one you take, subtract first. And so that, think of that as an artificial new cash flow stream. So enter those differences in your cash flow register. For CF0, enter 0 because the initial investment, let's say, is 100, minus 100, minus 100, minus, minus 100, you know? So minus 100, minus, minus 100, that becomes 0. So your C0, so then the first cash flow is 0, minus 100, minus, minus 100. You know, that's zero. And then, then do C1, C2, C3. And then, because we want to find a rate, uh, you don't hit the NPV button because that will ask you for a rate. Just hit the IRR and you'll get 8.7. It's a nice thing that you practice at home and you'll see. So now we're getting into some of the subtleties of uh, capital budgeting. Couple of reasons, important reasons, you know, why NPV profiles cross and why managers actually do not like NPV if you think about it. And they are all intuitive guys. It's all intuitive stuff, but you know, it needs to be brought out by me. One is, uh, think of it, I've mentioned it already, size or scale differences. So if you have a big scale difference, you know, between two projects, so the smaller project fees up funds at t equals zero for investment, and then if the higher the opportunity cost, the more valuable these funds. So a high discount rate actually favors small projects. And so you can have a reason, you can have NPV profiles cross as the interest rate changes uh, from zero to theoretically infinity. Also timing differences. You can have different projects with different speed, different payback speeds. If you have a, a, a project with a faster payback, it provides more cash flow in the early years for reinvestment. And so if the reinvestment rate or R, the discount rate is high, early cash flow is going to be desirable. So in this particular case, NPVS gets greater than NPVL. So Mike, here's the reinvestment rate assumption. NPV assumes that you reinvest at R, which is the opportunity cost of capital. That's the rate which is available in the marketplace. IRR assumes that you reinvest at the internal rate of return, which is being constantly sort of recalculated. And this reinvestment at opportunity cost is more realistic, so NPV method is best. And uh, of course, it's used to choose between mutually exclusive projects because with mutually exclusive projects, if you recall, the lines will cross 
and then there's going to be a conflict depending on what your market uh, cost of capital is. So as you know, finance, uh, finance uh, researchers, if I may say me included, you know, we, we keep thinking of ways and methods to improve what already appears to be nicely functioning. So like all the charts on the web, they're nice and easy and clean. And, but then you keep, you don't have to look at it actually. If, it, if you get it, you just get it. You see the problem there. So somebody came up with a modification for the internal rate of return. They know that managers like rates. They don't like dollar amounts. And especially corporate managers. Now, maybe small business owners, you know, they, because they're aware of, you know, their investment amounts, they think in dollar terms. They prefer IRR to NPV. Can we give them a better IRR? Yeah. It's called the MIRR. It's something you guys need to know, especially grad students. Undergrads may have seen this, but I sort of, you know, just to show it to them. You'll be asked to calculate it. It's no big deal. Looks busy, but it's not. It's very intuitive. You will like it, actually. It's the discount rate which causes the present value of a project's terminal value. New term, terminal value to equal the present value of cost. And terminal value is found by compounding inflows at the weighted average cost of capital. So basically, the MIRR assumes that intermediate cash flows are reinvested at the WAC. Uh, here's a formula here, but I'll... I'll it will become clearer when I go through this example that I've set up here. So this CIF is an intermediate cash flow. Instead of cash flow, I call it CIF, cash flow intermediate. You may want to think of it. And your K is your discount rate. So let's say Apple, you know, Apple has $800 million sitting there. It can always put it just in a bank, let's say, at a certain amount uh, without reinvesting it into trying to create a new kind of, a, uh, of an iPhone uh, which, uh, which goes beyond controlling the, the device with the movement of your retina. Uh, maybe 20, 30 years from now, it will be just mind bending, you know, mind, mind controlling. Adam gives me a big smile like that. I mean, I don't know whether that's a skeptical smile or, you know. It, it could happen. You know, I mean, if any of us went and told the cave people from a few thousand years back that they were living in a very primitive way, they would laugh us off, right? They thought they were styling, right? <laughs> they had fire. Huh? They had fire. And they have fire. They said we have roasted things. We have got good things going on, you know. <laughs> There's no problem, you know. And so, 100, 200 years from now, people may really think, I mean, I mean, the first person has already gotten a ticket for wearing a Google Glass. Uh, a, a, a female driver in, in San Diego, she's been testing out. She actually works in a company to make an app. Uh, and so she's been one of the earlier testers for, for, for uh, Google Glass. And she had a long commute, you know, and but she got, uh, she got ticketed for watching TV while driving. <laughs> and there's a California law against, you know, watching on screen. Yeah. So, you know, it, it happens. So, yeah, you know, uh, it's sure uh, uh, Apple could come up with something, but we don't know that yet. So for now, we will just say that Apple is going to reinvest at the opportunity cost of capital and intermediate cash flows are going to be compounded. So there are two variables here. This K is the market observable discount rate and MIRR is the variable that we're going to calculate. Enough talking on this here. Let me show you some numbers because it makes it easier in a certain way. Minus 100, that's the initial investment. You know the, the terminology by now. 10% is your market discount rate. That's your K. 10, 60, and 80 are your cash flows from your project. Notice what I'm doing here is this $10 is getting reinvested at 10%. You don't need the calculator. It's going to get compounded two periods, you know? So 10% at the end of the first year is going to become 10% plus 10% on that. That's 11. And, and then that's 1.1 on that. So that's $12.1. 60% invested for one year at 10% is going to be $66. I think you guys are okay with that. Add them up and that's your TV. Um, what does TV actually stand for, the other TV? Television, Television. yeah, thanks, yeah. See? So, <laughs> thanks, David. I thought it was a trick question. It really was. It really was. I mean, I know, see, I know TV's terminal value, but I was thinking about the other TV, you know. It's like, Good contribution for class, Dave. I'll make a note of that, you know? 
I mean, that'll get you right over the hurdle, right there, you know, my friend. Very nice. Yeah. <laughs> really? Oh. Actually, somebody is there. Is that Hillary there? Hello? Somebody's watching us. She's a big time sailor. She sailed the Atlantic or something like that. Are you there? Hello? Nice. All right, good. Watch the show. <laughs> uh, she's a she's a senior manager actually at Bath Iron Works. I think she has a, um, she mentioned that she has about 50, um, 50 professionals report to her. She took the trouble to come to my class, uh, to my office actually. So that was nice. Anyway, so you have one fifty eight point one dollars TV dollars here, but all of you know very well that's three years from now. Three years from now. It has to be discounted today. So that's three years from now, 158. So you discount it, three discounting periods. And that should be equal to $100 because we are shooting for NPV equal to zero. So at what, what number here will equate this fraction to be exactly equal to 100? And that's the calculation 16.5. Now once again, not throwing uh, mindless numbers at you. How's the screen quality there? It looks, it looks good. All right, great. Okay, no, that's fine. Thanks. Thanks. There was a way we could uh, send a slice of pizza over to you, but that can't happen. Disadvantage of taking an online class. <laughs> so this 16.5%, guys, is it actually is a number that I have to say something about. The internal rate of return on Project L was 18%. Because we are reinvesting at a lower opportunity cost of capital, that number is lower. So it's not just a number. So I have, I have to put it in, 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 uh, in, in, in the right context, OK? So the modified internal return always will have a downward bias to it because it's been adjusted downwards. And that's the correct adjustment. So the English way to say to it is a more conservative estimate, which is a good thing. Why use MIRR versus IRR? Like Mike Kuhn actually already preempted that uh, slide there. It correctly assumes reinvestment at the opportunity cost. Uh, it also avoids the problem of multiple internal rate of returns. And managers, they like rate of return comparisons. And so MIRR is better for this. So three reasons. It avoids the problem of multiple IRRs, assumes reinvestment at the opportunity cost, and manages like the rate of return comparisons as opposed to dollar numbers. Because then they're scale invariant in that sense. $250 million, $250,000, $2 billion, whatever it be. So this you have seen here, normal cash flow, non-normal cash flow, is basically the change of uh, signs there. And so I'd rather just show you a picture. This is a normal cash flow. An initial investment of 10,000 and it generates $2,000 for the next, uh, over the next eight years. A non-normal cash flow, you have a $20,000 investment, generates some cash inflows for you, and then again, $8,000 you have to invest, a big capital outlay. Like I said, you know, if you're working maybe for strip mining, you have to plant the forest, uh, or if you have, uh, let's say nuclear operation, or even other places where you have to do dredging and big cleanups. Uh, this is something you can see in a book. We are a little bit getting uh, crunched for time. We have three presentations, that's 33 to 90 minutes. And so we, we, I, I, can, I can steal five, seven minutes from you guys here. Uh, but multiple IRR returns, you really have to have, really frankly speaking, the only word is weird cash flows. Look at the cash flow here. Initial investment minus 1.6, and it generates $10. And then you have to put back in $10, or you lose $10. And so your NPV profile, when you have your NPV here, your uh, return rates here, you have uh, two points where the NPV profile intersects the x-axis. One is at 25%, and the other is 400%. So, as long as your cost of capital is between 25% and 400, your NPV is positive. And if I could shade it, this area here. 
Below 25 percent, there's a steep drop in your NPV, and above 400, again NPV drops. And so that's, that's a problem of multiple IRRs that you have, but NPVs, you know, they don't have that. Logic of multiple IRRs is something in the book 357, you can look at it. Uh, it's basically similar to timing and scale issues. Choosing the optimal capital budget, finance theory says to accept all positive NPV projects. But there are two problems that can occur when there is not enough internally generated cash to fund all positive NPV projects. One is an increasing marginal cost of capital and then capital rationing. I mean, I, I think from an individual to a corporation to a nation, uh, there's, a, there's a capital budgeting problem. Um, there are probably very few instances where there's infinite capital, you know. And so whenever there's a capital budgeting problem, there's capital rationing. And capital rationing means basically there's some kind of a allocation mechanism on how capital is allocated. And that's when the fights start, if you know what I mean. Is who gets to invest in what project? Then when there aren't any uh, in, in, uh, funds uh, uh, available internally, that's when external funds are raised. And we have had some high profile IPOs in the last one year, two of them being uh, uh, Facebook and uh, very recently Twitter, then external funds are raised. And then NPV calculations are done, and of course the NPV should be positive using this higher marginal cost of capital. And that's pretty much it actually. So, yeah. So that concludes this chapter on capital budgeting.